Hello, and thank you for joining us for Métis Memories of Residential Schools. My name is Diane Gerlich, the Dean at the Workland School of Education, University of Calgary. My family are Ukrainian settlers who immigrated to a place in Northeast Alberta, which is now called Marinam, which in Ukrainian means peace for us. I would first like to acknowledge the traditional lands on which we stand. We are broadcasting from Calgary, which is uh, on the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which include the Blackfoot Confederacy of Ghana, Bagani, Sitsika, Sutena First Nations, and Stony Nakoda, which include Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Land acknowledgements are a moment for us to pause and reflect. And um, I wanted to thank all of you who are in attendance tonight for your personal commitment as we approach September 30th, the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. And uh, this is a moment for us to learn and to listen with an intellectual humility of the knowledge and the stories that have been gifted to us by the Métis people. So thank you for joining us uh, as we learn together. Uh, I am so very excited about today's program. Residential, industrial, and day schools have had a long lasting impact on Métis communities. However, as noted in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada final report, Métis experiences have consistently been left out of Canada's national narratives, including limited recognition of the harms that were caused by the colonial schooling systems. Discussing their collaboration, Métis memories of residential schools, a testament to the strength of the Métis, Yvonne Poitrapat and Billy Joe Grant will share some of the 24 impactful stories about this neglected chapter in Canadian history. Currently, Métis Memories on Residential Schools is on display at the Canadian Museum, Museum of Human Rights. These stories honor the unique experiences of Métis survivors and their families in colonial schooling systems and showcase authentic Métis community voices in an ethical and collaborative way. I would like to encourage all the participants who have come to join us together tonight uh, to add your comments, your questions, your wonderings uh, in the chat room. And after the formal presentation, we're hoping for a bit of dialogue uh, to help support um, and to learn from these Métis voices. So with that, it is my honor and privilege to introduce tonight's speakers. Dr. Yvonne Patraprat, Métis, is an associate professor at the Workland School of Education. Yvonne's ancestral roots trace back to the historic Red River Settlement, and more recently to the Fishing Lake Métis Settlement in Northeastern Alberta. Yvonne has published in the realms of social justice, media studies, Métis Studies, Reconciliatory Pedagogy, Service Learning, and Integration of Arts in Education. She earned the National Allen Blizzard Award for Collaborative Teaching in 2021, the Confederation of Alberta Faculty Association's Distinguished Academic Early Career Award in 2018, and the Workland Teaching Excellence Award in 2016, just to name a few. Billy Joe Grant is a proud citizen of the Métis Nation of Alberta and an award-winning educator with over 20 years of classroom experience teaching kindergarten to grade nine in both public and Catholic school systems. Billy Joe was the recipient of the 2017 Inspire National Award in the role model category for Indigenous education. She also received a 2018 International Women's Award for her work in Indigenous education in her local community. Billy Joe completed a master's degree in 2018 and stepped out of the classroom into leadership to develop authentic, meaningful, and creative Métis resources with Rupert's Land Institute Métis Centre for Excellence, 
before returning to Greater St. Albert Catholic Schools this fall in the role of Indigenous consultant. I would also like to introduce Dr. Michael Hart, who will be moderating the dialogue following the formal presentation. Dr. Michael Hart is the Vice Provost Indigenous Engagement at the University of Calgary. Michael Hart is a citizen of the Fisher, Fisher River Cree Nation and sees the need for and is deeply committed to creating greater opportunities for Indigenous people. His career has focused on Indigenous peoples and ways of helping that will enable the University of Calgary to realize its goals for Indigenization on its campuses and others. He serves as a key champion and advocate for the university's indigenous strategy, Itapatop, and is a strong and visible role model for everyone, in particularly for indigenous scholars and students. Please enjoy today's presentation. Thank you, Diane. That was absolutely beautiful information and a very nice welcome. Thank you. So welcome, everyone. Uh, we are so happy that you are here to connect and learn and share with us this evening. Together, we will honor residential school survivors and their families. And sadly, this includes children that may not have made it home. The topics and images shared in our presentation can be triggering for many people. And please note the Indian Residential School Survivors Society toll-free number on the screen. You are also in a safe place to share your thoughts, questions, and feelings in a respectful manner. Sometimes these thoughts and feelings may come up at alternative time, and please reach out to a trusted friend or colleague or use the toll-free number to connect with someone. It's important to know that you are not alone and that someone is there for you. So as Diane said, I'm a proud Métis educator, mother, teacher, and citizen, and now an Indigenous consultant with Greater St. Albert Catholic Schools. This project has been an absolute heart work, working with community, working alongside the people that made this project possible. We laughed, we cried, and shared stories over the past few years to bring you the re-release of the book Métis Memories of Residential Schools, a testament to the strength of the Métis, and an accompanied teaching art mural resource. The Métis Memories art mural consists of 24 panels that share elements of the Métis residential school experience, and all of this work created was guided by Métis leader and elder Angie Carrar. This project has been made possible by the Canadian Heritage Grant through the Government of Canada, Rupert's Land Institute, the Métis Nation of Alberta, and the Workland School of Education. And I have to say this project was very personal for me. I actually saw Métis Memories book in an office when I first started at Rupert's Land, and I carried it around for two years before I found the right grant when Yvonne called me and said, we're going to do it. We're going to do something with the book. Um, and, and we certainly did. So it's been an absolute pleasure to work with Yvonne and grow with her. I'm embarrassed to say that I didn't hear about residential schools until later in life. And my mother attended Indian Day School and her father, my grandfather, attended a residential school. No one spoke about it then, and they still do not talk about it today. But once I had this piece of my family puzzle, I was able to put some pieces together. I was able to have a greater understanding of my own identity and upbringing, and was encouraged to look at my family in a different light through a kinder lens. I am truly humbled to be with, here with all of you this evening. Thank you so much, Billy Joe. So we would like to um, first introduce you to our team before uh, we welcome uh, Doreen Burgum into our space this evening as our, as our wonderful uh, Region 3 uh, Métis Elder. So in front of you, what you see is the tiny team that put together the Métis Memories um, Art Card Project. And from left to right, um, you're being introduced to Angie Carrere, who resides in the Grand Prairie region. She's a very, very active um, woman in our community. She's a matriarch and uh, she's someone who guided us with her wisdom and kindness and her courage. And she has a beautiful saying um, that really kept Billy Joe and I going throughout the project is that uh, together we are braver and together we are better. And so that ethos has really um, 
brought uh, a, a really strong thread of resiliency within what can be really difficult work. Um, as Métis people, we certainly um, have taken a very interesting role, I think, in Canadian society. And uh, with this project, what we're trying to do is bring awareness to the Métis experience, which is not often heard of. So myself, um, as Diane so eloquently pointed out in the bio, um, I'm Métis on both sides, mother and father. And um, this project it really starts to open up conversations in our communities that we're often reticent to do. Uh, the Métis have been on in many, many occasions told to be quiet and to hide their identity. And I know as a young child, that was never an option for me. Um, and I won't go into a, one of my stories, but I have many stories about not being quiet. To the right of Angie is Judy Daniels, and she is the amazing, um, author of the original Métis Memories of Residential School, um, the book that was published back in 2014 that Billy Joe is showing us. And she has been uh, shoulder to shoulder with us on this work. And she's a lawyer um, and she has such a strong community mindedness. She is just brilliant to work beside. Beside her is my own daughter, uh, Samantha. And Samantha is a registered nurse. She works in mental health nursing and she was the um, the artist. And so we're going to show you a piece of her work that actually uh, formed the basis for our montage. Beside uh, Samantha is Louis Lavois. So Louis, we commissioned as an artist for the mosaic. And uh, he was on a very steep learning curve, I can tell you, as he worked alongside this group of Métis women. Myself, um, I have the great pleasure of working at Workland under the um, apt leadership of Diane Gerlich and, of course, my dear colleague, Billy Joe Grant. So that team, um, we really pride ourselves on working collectively. And uh, so we never want to represent um, one voice. We want to ensure that we're respecting our community and the knowledge traditions that are very present within our communities. This slide is giving you a peek at some of the um, residential schools that are scattered throughout Alberta. And for those of you who know about residential schools, um, Alberta is home to one of the largest populations of residential schools across the country. And to the left, you are looking at St. Bernard's, which is in the Gruard region. It's also the location where many of the stories that are contained within the Métis Memories of Residential School print publication are from. And so um, it was also known as the St. Bernard Mission School. It was operated by the Catholic Church from 1894. So that's really early, even before we were a province, to 1957. And um, what is really, I think, interesting for educators to learn about, on the right-hand side of the screen, St. Paul de Métis Residential School um, is in the St. Paul region. Uh, that school was built exclusively for Métis children. And that school was... Um, burnt down shortly after it opened. And um, we in the Métis community have worked really hard to revise the St. Paul de Métis story. And so, um, you know, I think there are many stories throughout our province where if uh, the Métis people have the chance and the opportunity to work alongside fellow educators, we can help to unearth a lot of these hidden stories of the Métis. And so um, we have a beautiful piece uh, that Madam Patra, so uh, Audrey Patra, who's one of our longest standing Métis leaders um, across the homeland, she wrote a piece to Métis memories. And so I'll just briefly read this to you because it's a nice uh, introduction to what we're about to share with you. We, the Métis Nation, are an Indigenous people. We were born as a people and developed as a nation along the fur trade routes that wove the three prairie provinces, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, together with parts of Ontario, 
British Columbia, the Northwest Territories, and the Northern United States. This is the Métis Nation homeland. We made our living from our homeland and its resources. We governed ourselves. I'm gonna say that again. We governed ourselves. We were Otipimsawak, the free people, the people who own themselves. We recognize the land as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside on or are visiting. This dark chapter in our history is one that needs to be told for the healing of our people and for those Canadians who remain unaware of this national truth. In sharing these stories, we can begin to address the intergenerational impact this distressing legacy has had on our families and communities. For many Métis, these stories remain untold. Our hope is that the stories shared in this book and through this website will help the children and grandchildren of survivors begin to understand the experiences of their parents and how some of the family and community struggles we experience today are the result of residential schools. I commend the survivors whose stories appear in Métis Memories of Residential Schools, their courage and willingness to share this painful life experience helps to ensure this type of history will never be repeated again. The strength and pride of the Métis people endures and the Métis survivors of residential schools are exemplars of a resilient and determined nation. So with the um, words of Madame Petra ringing in our ears, I would like now to introduce to you one of the really incredible matriarchs um, here in Southern Alberta. She is Métis elder Doreen Burgum, and she is here to share an opening prayer with us this evening to help set the tone for the stories that we'll share with you briefly um, in this evening. So Doreen, I invite you to open your camera and your mic. And I am so proud to call Doreen, um, not only Katea Cree for elder, but also a dear friend. Um, I've known Doreen for many, many years and she is an incredibly strong woman. The Métis jigging music at the beginning was absolutely perfect because Doreen is an award-winning jigger. And I keep asking her to try to teach me how to jig properly. But for this evening, we are just so very honored, Doreen, to have you um, join us and to share a prayer for us and the attendees of this evening. Thank you, Yvonne. Can you see me? I'm. Yes. Okay. So, Tansa Kiwao, Doreen Burgum, Dishina Kishan, Ols Otetan, Nepapa. Ambrose Métis Le Femel, Boudreau Dumont, Nemama Mary Métis Le Femel, Dufresne Vaness. I said, hello, how are you? Hope everyone is fine. My name is Doreen Burgum. I come from the town of Olds. My father's name was Ambrose and the Métis families were Boudreau Dumont. And my mother's name is Mary and the Métis families are Dufresne Van Ness. God, our creator, on this day of remembering and mourning and recommitment, we recall the children who were taken and separated from their First Nations, Métis and Inuit families and taken to residential schools. We remember all the children who were forced to stop speaking their First Nations, Métis and Inuit languages, who were told their First Nations, Métis and Inuit cultures were wrong and were led to believe they were not good enough. We remember the children who were taken and raised away from the love and care 
of their families and communities. We remember with deep sorrow the many children who were abused and many children who died and never made it home. God, our creator, we are grateful for the strength of the First Nations, Métis and Inuit survivors who brought the truth of the wrongdoing and mistreatment of our First Nations, Métis and Inuit children to light. Strengthen us to ensure that all children are treated with dignity and respect. We pray for the healing for the families who experience and continue to experience the trauma of residential schools. God, our creator, show us and guide us on the path of reconciliation. Merci and de Twaninon. Many thanks, Doreen. Your words always uh, touch me and uh, that you're learning the chiff uh, is just incredibly beautiful. So thank you so very, very much, Doreen. I have tobacco. Um, I will, as promised, uh, bring it to you next time we meet. And I'm sure that will be very soon. Thank you. All right. So with that said, um, we would like to share and I, I feel like it's Billy Joe's turns to really <laughs> step in and introduce our, our next video. And well, we're going to be showing you who are the Métis video. And I think that's to position yourself, just to understand a little bit more about the Métis. But there are three things I'd like you to watch for. One, if you can identify where it is filmed. Two, pay careful attention to Angie Carrar's story, because we will be unpacking that after. And what does Madame Quatra, President Quatra, say it will take for reconciliation to happen? We're in a time of reconciliation that we want to continue well beyond this week. So those three things, where was it filmed? Pay close attention to Angie's story. And what will it take for reconciliation to happen? Thank you. Thanks, Billy Joe. Mimi is here. It's in your heart. You know who you are. You are raised in your culture. Uh, you, you knew your history. But most of all, you didn't have to be told. You knew it. You lived it. Well, certainly us as Métis people know who we are and have always known who we are. But you know, Métis is one of the Indigenous peoples of Canada, clearly uh, in the Constitution of Canada under Section 35. Uh, Métis people, sometimes when you think of Indigenous peoples of Canada, there's, you know, like First Nations, um, there's uh, Inuit, and, and people think Métis, but at the same time, like, we're not just kind of grouped in with First Nations, like we're, we're our own people, we have our own voice. Je vois the people of Métis come a person autonome who has l'autonomy and who has a culture and a language mixed. I think that if educators um, could relay that story like, to their Métis students, that you're part of a family and a community that is distinct, that's not, that is, they have their own culture and they have their own language, then the kids can go with a positive message and want to connect and understand. We have a word that's Otepemsawak, and that's we own ourselves. We are free people. We look after ourselves. And they have truly stood behind that from all history that we can look back on. Because of that, that's why we as a Métis people are resilient. We're entrepreneurs. We're also people that can adapt. I believe that Métis people have shown that they have built an economy. They have shown that they take ownership of their language, and they continue to show that throughout the decades. To be Métis in 2020 is to kind of take ownership over your own identity. I don't necessarily think there's a there's like a one-stop answer for it. Like even 
what, what it is to be Métis for myself might be different for another person. It's really important for educators to know not all the kids look Métis. There's no one way of looking Métis. You could learn one thing and the other family does it differently. And you have to respect that and like let them teach you or let yourself learn from community um, around them. It's very important to establish ourselves as a distinct people with a distinct language um, and a distinct way of being. The language is the essence of our culture. And for me, uh, being a Métis man, that's how I identify that I'm distinct. If you know the language or have an understanding about language, that is the essence of the culture. When we celebrate Métis culture in the classroom. It makes space for everyone to feel valued and for all the students to want to celebrate who they are and who their families are. Then it makes space for everyone to celebrate who they are. The Métis Nation knows themselves through family and through having that relational connection. And so that relational understanding of self is even in the small things. Oh, I had a happy childhood. Yeah, I remember we lived right off the land. That happiness was because our family unit was strong. And then when my mother passed away at TB, my whole world changed. And then they flew us to Fort Resolution. And here, they took us a big building, walk on those doors. Little did I know, a sense of losing all our family, our home, our community, that nobody were alone. I tried to put it behind and try to move forward. And my children, I would say my, my life and my children is what I concentrate on, my media heritage and my, my community, my people that I love. So I believe true reconciliation will come when people understand who we are and why we want everyone to work with us and contribute together. All Canadian families have this historical relationship with Métis um, community that needs to be honoured so that we can um, build a better future together that's more honouring towards each other. There, there's so much to learn and there's so much more than what's just taught in schools and it's almost like once it's a thread that kind of gets pulled, you can kind of keep on pulling it. I think actually coming to learn different aspects of who I was at a much, at a more mature state in my life, I think it was really beneficial for me because I was able to do some deep reflection and I think that no matter the age, I think it's super lovely and great to know where you come from and who you are. I know who I am. And to me, it's so important. That's my lifeline. It took me many, many years to actually come out and be visible and, ha and be able to speak out. Now we get to be a part of bringing that Métis story in the classroom and helping, letting them experience and celebrate their identity. And I think that's what, it, that's what it takes, is our people who are in those key positions today and in schools, really teaching our kids the proper history of this country. I think it's gonna make an amazing change to how the Métis will feel no longer forgotten, no longer uh, ignored. Thank you, Yvonne. That is such a beautiful video. I know it was a little glitchy, a little uh, slower, but I did put the link um, up there and very proud to say that that video has been viewed over 12,000 times um, in two years. So, so there's so much information in there and I hope you got a little... Um, a little peek of Métis Crossing. I saw that somebody noticed uh, that that was the location. That is actually where the mural is housed right now, a 17-foot mural, and that's where it found its home. Um, 
So what will it take for reconciliation to happen, for people to understand the true story of who Métis people are? So important, so important. So we can go to the next slide, Yvonne, and um, have a little peek at the mural. We're going to show you one of the story murals. And this one is actually Angie Carrars. So I am and just um, moving into, it's um, our Google slide has just shut down. So I think it's important here um, to just talk about the need for collaboration in this type of work. And so um, Billy Joe, if you could just speak to some of the ways in which we started the, the work, um, how we, uh, you know, particularly, I think the way that you started with the, the book and carrying it around and I will. Yeah, well, I guess what I would say about this project is I always say it's ancestor led. Um, there were so many pieces that just came together that were so beyond the work that we were doing. You know, um, Yvonne and I always had a connection and um, we love to work together and make things happen. And um, we actually met when I started at Rupert's Land through the Alberta Métis Education Council. So that was quite exciting. And, you know, like then it was President Quatra. I said, well, where, who wrote this book? We didn't even know who wrote it. It was not in the 2004 release. And so she says, I think that Jude Daniels might know. And I gave her a call and she says, well, Billy Joe, I co-wrote it. Of course I did. So that's how she came on board. Um, we met with Angie and, you know, our plan was to, to go around and meet with other survivors. And then COVID hit. And that changed everything as you well know. But then I found that people were finding us. So um, Yvonne, if you're having trouble with that, I just want to show um, Angie's. All right, I'm stopping share and go ahead. Okay. Let me just take a look at what you're looking at. So what you should be seeing is Angie Carrars panel for I'm just going to try and move some of these things out of the way so that you get a better look at it. So this is actually the, one of the first panels that was done. So this is Angie Carrar's story. And we met with Lewis. Now Lewis Lavoie was the only one on the team that is not Métis. Um, he is local to St. Albert and I've used his resources before and I saw the power of them. I worked with um, his resources as young as grade one. I would put magnet on the back and I would stick them on my whiteboard and kids would do his puzzles. But then I was in Belize doing volunteer work with adults and I used it. So I saw the power and what could happen when uh, these stories come together as a collective. So this is Angie's story and I'm gonna read a portion of it because she's not here to um, speak to it. And like we said, everything is connected to this book, Métis Memories of Residential School. And Angie's story is on page 125 of the book. On January 15th, 1948. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna start some more. Good afternoon, I'm here to tell my story. I'm starting to feel the pain already because it's something that I had buried for so many years. As a child, I was raised in a Métis community. With my three sisters and four brothers, we had a happy life. My mother did a lot of gardening and she did a lot of herbal medicine. My dad worked at the Hudson Bay Company and also as an interpreter. We had a very happy childhood and my dad instilled of us the value and pride of being Métis. I lived a very happy life, was a happy child, we all were. My mother did a lot of sewing and we always had new parkas, new mittens and mucklucks and so on. We always had adequate food as my mother was a very good cook. She could cook from scratch and that's something she taught me, which I brought down to my own children. On January 15th, 1948, that all came to an end. My, other, my mother had TB, tuberculosis, and she was on her deathbed. So the priest took us to the convent at Fort Resolution. I was nine, my younger sister was six, and the other one was three. We walked into the room on that cold day we walked right into the gray sheets hanging in the hall in the smell of fish. We went upstairs where all the girls were and we were introduced to about 115 children, all girls at that time. 
That first week, my mother died. Two days after we got there, we only heard about it a week later. A nun took us into a room and told us, you are now orphans, your mother is dead. I remember holding my sisters. I remember crying. I remember feeling so alone and so lost and so very lonely. Before we had left Yellowknife and my mother, we went to visit her and she told me at that time, Angie, look after your family. And I have done that until today. It was brutal, it was humiliating, and I don't have the words to express how I really feel about those years that I and my sister spent behind those convent doors. So you'll see this panel is Angie's story, the day she was taken. And when Lewis would paint, he would paint and then he would bring the panels back to us and we would write all over them and we would talk about them. We'd say, no, wrong shoes. The hands need to clutch a little tighter. The faces a little sadder. The facelessness of the RCMP officer, the darkness, the cold, those were all really important components um, that Lewis was so good at coming back again and again and listening to us as we wanted to get this right. Um, and it's not us getting it right, it's this for the storytellers, it's for the community, it is their words, their stories, and this is who it belongs to. So this was Angie's story. Um, and then we have the beauty of this. So it was important that we didn't only show resilience and pain, but that there was resilience and the beauty of who we are as a nation. And that's why there will be a collective image at the end. So this is four generations of love. So this is Angie. And this panel came and Angie wasn't smiling. And we're like, no, she had to go back. She needs to be smiling. That was important. Um, so this is Angie, her daughter, her granddaughter, and her great-granddaughter four uh, generations of love. So what a beautiful testament. I'm not sure if you can share yet. I'm just going to go back to one more story before we share. Because when you look at the panels digitally, you'll be able to find teaching statements, reflective questions, and how to learn and where to learn more. With the art cards that you purchase, there's teaching statements and reflective questions. It's only the digital resource that teaches you um, the foundational piece to that. So this was another panel. This was another one that was one of the first ones. And how this came about is I had a call and I had a call from Karen Jones. And I was working on a course that empowered Métis educators. And she said, Billy Joe, I really wanna be part of that, but I'm in BC and we talked about it. And yes, we're gonna get you in, Karen. And then she says, Billy Joe, I have one more thing to ask you before we go. Yes. Have you heard of the book, Métis Memories of Residential Schools? And I said, well, Karen, have I ever? I have it right next to me. And Dr. Yvonne Poitra Pratt and I wrote a grant. We asked for 50,000. We got 38.5. We're going to do something. Will you be part of it? And, well, actually, I didn't ask her if she was going to be part of it until she said to me, she says, Billy Joe, you need to know my mom is the first story in that book. Now she found me, she came to me, and this is why I say it was ancestor led. And then I said, can you be part of it? And she was, her mom has passed on, um, but this is her mom's image. She was a spokesperson for their family to talk about what they wanted to see, how they want, wanted their mother represented. And this, this, her looking in the mirror was part of her holding her kids tight, keeping them safe. It was also love of herself as a child that she didn't get to be. Um, part of Maggie's story is that she did not want to be Indigenous because it meant pain to her. And I, I can understand that. I, I felt that myself in my life. In the background, you'll see that this was dedicated to Julie, um, the little girl in the bed that she was cuddling because it was so cold. All A lot of the stories talk about the cold and um, so she was cuddling Julie and they kept each other safe and warm. And Karen said to me, we hoped that Julie made it home because my mom talked about her her whole life. And one day she just went missing. Now in March, there was ground penetrating radar up at Gruard and there was 139 anomalies. And I did reach out to Karen because we don't know that maybe that's where Julie is because nobody ever knew where she went. She may have been one of those children that didn't make it home. And so a lot of power behind these panels, um, a lot of ways to talk about residential schools um, in a way that's safe. 
and age appropriate. So as an adult with this panel, I should know as an adult that food was used as a weapon against Indigenous families and children. I should know that children were experimented, had nutritional experiments done on them at residential school. But as a small child, I don't need to know that. But what I, an introduction to residential schools might be something as simple as, okay, what food do you not like eating? Can you imagine if you had to eat that every day? That is an introduction to residential schools for young children. It isn't about the trauma. It's about learning about our culture, learning about who we are, just like President Proctor said, the truth and who we are from the Métis perspective. Thank you so much, Palito. Um, I've got screen sharing back, if that's okay, if I'll grab right. Wonderful, thank you so much. And we've um, going to bring you really quickly uh, that, that story about Karen Jones and the coincidence of um, meeting Billy Joe, but you know, for many people, we don't believe in the coincidences, but rather it's the ancestors coming to us. Um, this image, uh, what we did with the mural um, mosaic is we very carefully uh, balanced the story of the, uh, you know, the dark history of the Métis. And for the Métis, uh, we have a very unique experience in residential schools. Many Métis families um, paid to go to residential school. So I'll say that again, they paid to go to residential schooling. Um, and you know the irony of that is, is really dark. A lot of our people were used as convenient quotas by those who had to meet a certain amount of children in the schooling system. And so the Métis would be taken in, oftentimes based on what they look like, so their physical characteristics or what their family uh, was experiencing socioeconomically, if they were road allowance people. Um, Oftentimes, you know, they weren't taxpayers, they weren't uh, privy to the public schooling system. And so therefore, residential schooling became a, a plausible option, um, sadly. So there's all kinds of, of different stories around the Métis experience in residential schooling. What you see in front of you is we wanted to make sure that those dark stories um, and that original publication has many, many stories about the, the darker side of the residential schooling. But in front of you, we have a very um, vivid image and it's a beautiful image of hopefully you recognize the Red River cart. And the Red River cart is the way that our people engaged in economic trade across Turtle Island. So not just across what is now Canada, but across North America. And what is uh, striking to us as Métis people is not only the fact that, um, you know, our beloved Red River cart, uh, which was coincidentally made without any um, steel, but rather was made with wood and leather alone. Um, it, so it was quite an engineering feat. But when Lewis originally heard us talk about the, um, you know, this image that we wanted around the Red River cart, he, he originally painted um, a donkey, but like, a, you know, a, an ass. And uh, we, <laughs> we took a look at the image and we said, um, no, not that, not that. Um, and so my family comes from a very strong, strong horse uh, background. We owned, I think, 250 head of horse up in the St. Paul de Métis region. And my father, I remember him teaching me the different types of horses, the Pintos, the Appaloosas, and um, he broke horses. That's what he did. And, and his whole family had this beautiful um, horsing uh, tradition within our, our generations. And so we said to Lewis, no, the Métis would have a very beautiful horse and it would be the quilted blanket would be decorated with the embroidery and it would be, you know, it would be a point of pride for our people. So he very quickly changed the image to suit what we wanted. And uh, so it's just illustrative. I think of, um, you know, when you involve Métis people, some people might have a certain idea, but when we step in and we recall our family stories, then things um, 
can be reverted to what we know as the truth. So that's what that image uh, brings to mind. And so um, this slide shows you the, uh, the original image that actually formed the basis for our mural mosaic. And so um, my daughter, Samantha, is a um, part-time artist, I think is how I can best describe her. She is a mental health nurse. But one evening, um, I was getting ready to actually head up to Rupert's Land because I worked in Edmonton for a year as their associate director of Métis education. And I said, you know, I'd really love to have something uh, symbolic of the Métis. So she said, oh, I can do that for you. So she shut her bedroom door and an hour later emerged with three distinct panels of the Métis sash. And she said, what about this? And what, I, I mean, other than being shocked at how quickly she produced it, what it is is very symbolic, and this is the, what she shared with me. She said, all three panels must be placed together or they won't form the collective image. And so you always have to keep them together, Mom. And so I think that is something that we um, really found meaningful within our community work. So Louis Lavoy, Paul Lavoy were commissioned as the artists on the uh, mural and this is what we ended up with. So Billy Joe, over to you. Oh, you're muted. There's my a full on project here. And then you have the link to Métis Memories where you can access it on the website where I was showing you earlier. And it's really important to bring it, dial it down and look at the images one at a time before putting them together because it really is the collective image that is the power behind it. Um, I think, do you want me to show that video quickly, Yvonne, where you can see how it was put up? Um, so this full-on mural is up at Métis Crossing. It found its home there uh, right before Family Day long weekend. Let's see if we can do this. Okay, so here it is. So you can see how they put it up um, and had to find the right place for it. So on Friday, we'll be talking about the unveiling. It's been up since February. It is now being showcased because there's a mobile mural. Um, I'm not sure if you remember me talking about how I would, I would cut out magnet and put it on the back. So we actually have one that has proper magnets on it that fits a four by six um, bulletin board. So that's pretty exciting. So that's the idea. So that's the one that's up in the Canadian Human Rights Museum. And it'll be up there till 2023, January. And then it will actually be in the lobby of the Fairmont Hotel as well, because we have two mobile murals and in Winnipeg. And I thought that was a great location. And it's a great way to talk to people about Fairmont has a lot of work to do. And when you look at all you have to do is look at the location of their hotels. And we know that was probably not ethical community engagement um, that they have that land. So I think if we have some questions now. Yeah, did you want to go ahead and cue the video or we should probably maybe just advance, Can right? I Didn't I show the video? <laughs> I did. I'm not I seeing your screen, so yeah. So um, yeah, so yeah, absolutely. I think um, we so appreciate your time and this was just like a skim on top of the surface of the type of work uh, that Billy Joe and I have been engaged in with the Métis community. And I think um, before we do turn it over um, to the audience, uh, absolutely we'll be bringing Michael Hart back on screen to help us. But we do want to mention the power of art in this type of, of work because it is so very difficult um, material to teach, to learn about. We know how it, it's um, heartbreaking. And oftentimes the arts allow us an entry point into what is very, very difficult work. And so um, I can't see your screen, Billy Joe, so that's why I'm getting a little discombobulated. But um, the QR code that hopefully you're seeing, you can go ahead and use that digital interactive resource 
Um, at your pleasure. Uh, we've really tried to make it easy for you to learn about Métis experiences. And so with that said, I think uh, we'll turn it over to Dr. Hart, uh, who is joining us all the way from Toronto. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, having me here. I'm just uh, I'm almost overwhelmed in terms of thinking about the, this resource and, and the connections uh, that it has to, to other resources, even in, in the thoughts that it's going to create. So I'm, I'm uh, truly honored to, to be involved in, in this event. I, I think that it's really important for us uh, to, uh, just as you're saying, take uh, the hidden messages out and bring them up front. Uh, amongst the messages I, I think of is uh, when Lou Riel, and you're going to have to forgive me if I don't quote exactly because I'm going by memory, uh, that it would be after 100 years that it would be the artists who will, I'm going to say, bring forward uh, the Métis people once again, the Métis nation once again. And so I think uh, this is such a suitable and uh, an important piece of work that uh, you've brought forward. So thank you very much for having me here. Thank you very much for your work, uh, Yvonne and Billy Joe. Um, before we begin this part of the evening, I would like to take, like to remind you to, uh, to type your questions for Yvonne and Billy Joe into the Q&A tab located at the bottom of your Zoom window. You will find this in the same area as your reaction tab. Um, so we do have some questions that are coming in. Uh, our goal is to answer as many questions as we can, so I hope you'll take the time uh, to, to uh, take this time to bring your questions forward. It's a great learning opportunity with some amazing people um, that are present here. With that said, the first question is um, from Clayton McGilvery, who asks, why was it important to include examples of Métis culture and resilience alongside darker truths about residential school? I'll open that up to either of you if you want to go for it. I, you know what, um, I will take a shot at it from a personal point of view. Um, as a Métis woman, I will always say that I'm a proud Métis woman. I was not a proud Métis child. And, and that was because I saw a lot of trauma around me. I saw a lot of dysfunction. And it wasn't until later in life that I got to see the beauty of the Métis nation and the people and the, you know, what was happening in um, our nation and that I was part of that. And so I think that was really important. And especially from an educator, we want students to know the truth from a Métis perspective about who we are and the strength. We want children to be proud of who they are. We want educators to act as a bridge between homes and school to share the beauty of the Métis nation and the Métis people. And I think, yeah, from my perspective, um, it's really important that we start with decolonizing ourselves. And uh, I know when I went back to university, one of the first things I had to do is I had to shed those colonial stories that were told about the half breeds. And that's a term we can use, by the way, but please don't use it yourselves. Um, but uh, yeah, it was really important because I went through a colonial schooling system that, that really demonized our people and vilified our role in Canadian history. And so that shame was brought into our family home. And I think it um, you know, resulted in a lot of hard times, not only inside our family homes, but in the community, at the wider community. So having those stories of our resilience and our strength, despite our very unique experience in Canadian history is important because we want to balance out what has been said about us, what has been um, the perspective taken against our people and balance it out with some of our truths. So that's, uh, that would be my answer. Thank you very much uh, to each of you for sharing that. I, I wanted to add a little bit uh, or add a question, uh, a part B to, uh, to what was asked. And that is if you, had your first message to go out to people in terms of who you really are and tie that to uh, the residential school experience, what would that message be? Tough question, you know. 
I, I was no waiting problem. for Billy Joe, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I think for me, uh, that's a really great question, I think, Michael, because it's, um, you know, we're working with a really strong focus on residential schooling experience in this session. But Billy Joe and I work across a wide swath of different areas. And one of the things that um, I've been thinking about as a Métis woman is, um, you know, my own mother just revealed to me that she um, attended residential school for two days and she witnessed some violence against a 16 year old girl. And so she and her sister um, ended up leaving in the in the dark of night and ran home. And so, you know, I think about those kinds of stories and then attach them to the work that we're doing. Um, residential schooling, horrible, deplorable, um, and I might even say disgusting era in our Canadian history. But there's also this, um, for me, when I, when I look at residential schooling, it's one part of a colonial history that, devastated us beyond the schooling. And so if you think about the Métis and our resistance, um, my own uh, ancestors being involved in the 1869 provisional government and then in the 1885 resistance, and then you know learning that my great-great-grandfather was brutalized by the colonial forces, like these, these things surround the schooling experience and they go well beyond, I think, um, you know, one segment of our story. And so, you know, I bring all of that when I'm uh, teaching and when I'm working with community, uh, that understanding of the impact of a colonial history on our families, our communities, and, and it's ongoing today. Billy Joe? And I, think, and I think for me, a lot of it is how do we move from what we think we know in our mind and move it to our hearts because that's what is going to help move reconciliation forward. So one of the things that I do talk to about teachers is epigenetics and we do discuss that on the online mural um, in that resource and what that is is it's a theory that trauma is passed on through DNA. So whether is so that is part of who we are that is what is in the classrooms our children are in the classrooms they have the trauma within them um and it is you know it's you know there it has been said that um every indigenous person you know is like a third a second third or fourth generation residential school survivor of some kind um, you know, and there's still a lot of families that don't want to talk about it. There's still families that think it was okay, that they survived it. Um, so it wasn't a big deal. Well, I will tell you that I didn't understand that piece. That was a missing piece of my life to be able to look at my family and say, okay, that's why that was. And there's still so many missing pieces that I just have to try and make sense of, um, because that's what we want to do. We want to move forward. We want to do better for next generations. Thank you very much. I, uh, I, I'm uh, continuously learning despite all of uh, the work that I've spent. So I just re-emphasize how important it is that no matter how old we are, I'm not that old, uh, no matter how old we are, that uh, we're continuing learning. And sometimes uh, some of us have to turn to those who have further along the journey. So I appreciate uh, what you're sharing. Another question that's come forward from a, an anonymous attendee. You shared an example of how teachers and parents can introduce this history to younger students and children. Can you offer a few more examples? Billy Joe, do you want to go ahead and um, there's, I can. yeah, I'm there's. Up, I'm just going to pull up the mirror just because it makes it easier for me. So we were looking, um, this is another one that I think as an educator and someone who creates resources, sorry, I've got like a lot of panels open here. I'm sorry. I'm going to try to move them out of your way so you can see that panel. So this is one um, of the panels that we wanted to ensure that there was culture. So if we were looking at this, this actually represents the communities that were left without children. So we think of the children in the schools and rightly so. And then one day we started talking about the families that were left behind. Um, and I liken that when I'm talking to educators about schools without children in them. How did, how empty did they feel? 
we children are joyful we love it when we see them dancing and um, singing and just talking they they lift our spirits so this panel represents um, children being taken away but if I was talking to younger children about it I might say hmm, have you ever had a sleepover away from your parents what do you think they do when you're away or do you think like how do you feel when you're away from your parents do you think they feel sad or happy or what do you think they're doing um there's lots of cultural pieces in here that you could just talk about the sash the moccasins the infinity sign the beadwork so there's all kinds of things the braided rug so here's your teachings and then you would just dial it back for younger kids and you know what I say children but there are some adults that need to start there as well and that's okay um this one speaks to the governance structure and as much as it looks like a long time ago if you look at those wristbands that's actually how we vote at an annual general assembly and this is a uh, barn in the background is Métis crossing so you know you could talk about why do we raise our hands are we are we do we have something to contribute so things like that what what does that look like self determination and action um Oh, feeling invisible. Do you ever feel like nobody sees you? So just basic questions that get people talking. Mm -hmm. So I hope that helps. Thank you very much for that. I think uh, one of the piece tied to uh, the learning that I, I believe you addressed in the chat, uh, Yvonne, but, and some others, but I want to uh, make sure everyone uh, has the opportunity to, uh, to pay attention to it and it, it has to do with the Métis language. Um, can you tell us about the Métis language and its roots? So our uh, ancestral language is Michif and so it is a complex uh, amalgamation of, of several different languages. So the First Nations uh, dialect that we would use would be representative of the area that our people settled in and the European languages that were incorporated into this complex um, intertwining of languages. It's been described as one of, Machif has been described as one of the most linguistically complex languages around the globe. It's not Creole, it's not Pidgin. It is this very um, uh, beautiful language really. And uh, we, the First Nations um, language, whether it's Cree, Ojibwe, Anishinaabe, um, so too, would be reflective typically of our maternal side. So um, whoever our the forefathers would have married into in that district. And so the language would evolve and represent wherever our people settled. And so oftentimes Michif, uh, the Machif that many people know, if they know of it, uh, incorporates a lot of French as the nouns, but the uh, First Nations dialect and language is used as the verb. So it's um, often, there's a smattering of, of English in there, um, depending on where our people were living. And so it's just this beautiful, beautiful, um, um, reflective language. I think it really honors who we are and who we're connected to and who our relatives are. And so we just actually finished up a big project at Workland um, supporting Rupert's Land in um, helping our people start to recover our language. And it's so exciting because there's resources galore coming out and we're seeing young people now take up um, free courses online and we're starting to hear our people speak the language again. Um, and so, yeah, so Machif is just this incredible language that is so beautiful for, I, when I go on walks, I listen to it to start to get the rhythm of the language. Thank you, Yvonne. The, uh, the, the nation that I'm from has many uh, Métis communities uh, right, right close nearby us and there's a strong uh, or right beside us uh, is uh, one one of the communities, and the the little bit that has been shared with me about the Métis language has to do with the um, the indigenous languages are often verb based and coming from uh, borrowing from the French the nouns and you, when you start thinking about that combination, it, it truly is beautiful. So I appreciate your your words. Um, 
I'm going to share another question from uh, Willie Smolka. I per forgive me if I mispronounce your name, Willie. A colleague recently found out about their Métis heritage, but their family refused to speak of it, and their parents have both passed. Is this common? Were there Métis settlements in Quebec too? Uh-oh, uh we always have to get into the politics and the identity questions. So Willie, um, this is a common story. This is a common narrative of the Métis, the hiding of our ancestry. Um, it was a survival tactic after the 1885 resistance. And so many Métis families went underground, many moved um, to different places. Some of us are in the Turtle Mountain Chippewa area down in the Northern United States. Um, and so, you know, that uh, hiding of identity is, is a way of, of surviving once you're, um, you know, you can only just think about what life would have been like for a Métis person. Um, I was in Batash for the first time this summer and, and went to the graveyard and, um, you know, was listening to the stories of our people and how they stood off the Canadian army, which is massive compared to the hundreds uh, of Métis people and for four days they they were able to hold off the Canadian army and its onslaught with the Gatling gun against our people and then the hanging of Louis Riel signaled the you know how um, our people were, then became viewed by Canadian society so those Métis uh, that had to exist and in a society that really had vilified them um, I think, you know, our people did, they did go down underground, then they either tried to pass, uh, some might have tried assimilation, and we're really proud to say that most of us didn't, and, you know, we fight to be recognized as Indigenous peoples, and I think that's something really unique about the Métis. Uh, we deliberately chose our Indigenous ancestry, and, you know, for the years since we've been placed into the Canadian Constitution, we've gained no rights, uh, Indigenous rights from that belongingness other than in name. So I don't know, Billy Joe, what did I miss out there? Um, well, I think I was just going to touch a little bit on that, because I think that sometimes there's that um, false understanding that Métis is mixed. And I even have friends who believe, who said, what do you mean? Like the dad's First Nations and the mom is white, so their kid is Métis. No, no, it has to tie back to that homeland. Um, and that is a big part of it. It's it's very like people are saying, oh, it's gets so fussy, and I, you know, I'm having a hard time getting my citizenship. It's not status, it's citizen citizenship. And it's important that there is that in place for the integrity. So the bottom line is it takes a Métis to make a Métis. Right, so that is where our history comes from. That's where identity comes through the process of ethnogenesis. And I think that Yvonne, you did touch on that, that after the um, execution of Louis Riel, it was no longer safe to be Métis. So people went every way. And if I was dark enough, I could probably go on to a uh, reserve and I could say I was First Nations. I could, if I was uh, white passing, I might go into the town and I might just say I'm Spanish or French or something. And that's where Yvonne was talking about the road allowances, the people that didn't fit anywhere. Um, and where did they go? So yeah, thank you. Good questions. Mm -hmm. And the, the Quebec one, I'm going to sidestep <laughs> because it's quite a political hot potato right now. Um, so I, I think we'd have to have another session for that one. How about that? <laughs> yeah, that's I, all on Métis history and identity. <laughs> yeah. I, I could fully appreciate that, especially since we're, we have gone longer than expected. And uh, so I'm going to take time for one more last uh, one last question. And so uh, the, the last question I'm going to is if you had the opportunity to expand upon this project and include more tiles, what additional parts of the Métis story might they address? Wow, that's a really great question. Um, I know <laughs> Joe's got an idea. She's, uh, yeah, I just love working with Billy Joe because she's super creative. For me, right now, um, uh, and I think I can share this with you, we as Metis people are fighting for self governance. And in fact, at the 
General Assembly in Calgary this year. Uh, we had about 500 Métis voting on our wish to move forward with a self-governance structure. And so we are um, really looking at how we want to govern ourselves, how we want to uh, be considered nat nation to nation with the, um, the state uh, nation called Canada. And so for me, tiles around, um, you know, how the Métis experience differs because we, you know, we legally petitioned uh, Upper and Lower Canada to join and were ignored uh, by McDonald uh, back in history. And so, you know, we've, we've actually been very astute around how we've uh, set up governing structures to, to uh, negotiate how we are with each other. And so I can very happily say that we're returning back to our traditional roots. When I look at the constitution that's being circulated around the Métis Nation of Alberta now, we are really uh, starting to recognize our traditional values and our traditional ways of, of being together. And so I think a mural mosaic that would teach about that really complex sort of history would be fascinating. Billy Joe, I saw you doing the woot woot. <laughs> oh, I have lots of ideas. So one is this project isn't done. Like I know that we're talking about it now, but there is a lot of unpacking to do. There's a, it's got a lot of movement that it needs to happen. Um, like I said, we wanted it to be a mobile mural so they can go out and continue this good work. Um, one of the other things I would think on expansion of a resource would be to have those positive role models because that was so important to me. And I wanna share that with students. So that they are seeing, like it's not, um, it is important that we have role models like Louis Riel, but it's important that we, showcase our role models like Doreen Burgum and Angie Carrar and President Patra. Like look at those three amazing matriarchs. Like how can you not be so proud to be Métis knowing them and be inspired by them? And there's so many people like that. Like we just need to keep elevating and showcasing. Thank you so much, Billy Joe. Thank you very much, Yvonne. This evening has been a, a real pleasure for me. And I, 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 from the comments, I could see a pleasure for many other people in terms of opportunity to learn. But I also acknowledge that some of this information can be impactful. So I encourage people to note uh, the toll-free numbers. Uh, they should be put up in the chat again once more. And if not, you can scroll back and, and see them. Uh, the toll-free numbers, if you wish to speak to somebody about what is stirred for you, or to turn to your own personal support system to walk through what you're experiencing. Uh, I also want to extend uh, thanks to Diane for opening the evening and supporting this much, this much needed education. So thank you very much, Diane. And uh, I'd like you um, for, I'd like to thank you all for choosing your sharing to blah. It's late over here in, uh, in Toronto. <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank all of you for choosing to share your evening with us. I'm going to ask uh, Doreen to support us um, to move into our evening in a good way by offering a closing prayer. Doreen, are you available? Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to, to say the prayers this evening, in, um, especially in honor of my dear friend, Angie Career. Uh, when she went to visit the Pope, um, my friend wrote this prayer probably 30 years ago. And uh, when she went to visit the Pope, I don't know if you told the story about uh, Angie with her two sisters at the residential school. And when they left uh, their home, her mother told Angie to look after her sisters. And uh, so she did. And I believe Angie was only eight and the other sister was six and one was three. But uh, Angie uh, stood up for her sisters all along and stole food and did all sorts of things to look after her sisters. So one day they got together as little girls and they said, who are we gonna tell? Who can we tell and ask why we're getting treated so badly. So they all decided, let's tell the Pope. So Angie being 85, and when 
uh, Métis Nation of Alberta asked, asked her to uh, fly to Rome to visit the Pope and tell her story. She said, this is a dream come true because my sisters and I decided we should go and tell the Pope that, that this is wrong. So I gave her this prayer and it's in, she took it to Rome and um, this is how it goes. Father, you're no respecter of persons. You know me by my name. Why am I here before you? With no face, my race, a shame. You've accepted me in the beloved. You meet me in places of prayer. But within the great congregation, my face, my race is not there. You've invited me into your presence, gathered me to your great throne. Even here with saints all around me, my face, my race is unknown. You sent me my ministry to others, praying grace into hearts of stone. I stand forlorn at the close of the day, my face, my race, hauntingly alone. Listen to me, my chosen, my love. What you look for, you cannot see. The beautiful countenance created within. Your face, your race, reflects back for me. Hear me now, my sent out one. Understand that from places of prayer, my child, you're standing behind your face. Your face, your race, brightly shines everywhere. Come closer to me, handmaiden of God. You cannot gaze upon your own face. It's to others this beautiful gift has been given. Your face, your race is my gift of grace. Thank you and just run on. on. Many thanks, Doreen. I want to say a uh, mercy to all. May your evening be filled with reflections and the coming day continued learning of Métis history, current realities, and aspirations. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>